Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayek Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is truly a lifestyle. Jesus of Nazareth is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the Holy Bible, the written recorded Word of God, is our only standard and authority for truth. And together God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, are you falling in love with Jesus more and more every day? Are you sensing a need for his word in your spirit each and every day? Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? And are you learning to hate and despise sin in all of its most simple, deceptive ways? Well, I trust that you are, and as you sit under the Word of God, that's exactly what is supposed to take place in your soul. And so I invite you just to take a moment and thank the Lord for the things that He is doing in your life. For these desires come only from His hand and are confirmation that you truly belong to Him. Now, we're continuing our study through the story of the Bible and when we were last together, we saw the deception that the serpent used to tempt Eve. And when God enters into the garden, he finds Adam and Eve hiding, having covered themselves, trying to cover their sin, their act of disobedience. And so we pick up in verse 9, God calls unto Adam, and he says unto him, Where are you? And Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid. Now remember, in chapter 2, verse 25, it tells us that both Adam and Eve were naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. But now shame has entered. And so because of this shame, Adam hid himself. And God said unto Adam in verse 11, Who told you that you were naked? Why do you feel this shame? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me. Now notice that Adam very subtly shifts the blame back to God. He says, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. As if you had never created this woman, I would have never fell into this sin. And so Adam is taking no responsibility for his choice in the matter. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this thou hast done? And the woman said, playing the same blame game, the serpent beguiled me, the serpent seduced me, the serpent lured me, and I did eat. Now, do you remember in James chapter 1 and verse 13, it says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt any man with evil. But every man is tempted. In the Greek, this word tempted means lured. It means baited. And so every man is baited when he is drawn away of his own lust, of his own desires, and he is enticed. Again, he is lured. He is baited. And when that desire, when that lust has conceived, when it has taken the person prisoner, it brings forth sin and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death, spiritual death. And that's what's taking place here in the garden as Eve is explaining to God that she was baited. She was lured by the serpent, by the desire to know more, to be more. And because of this, she did eat. Verse 14, the Lord God said unto the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle above every beast of the field. Upon your belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. Now what this tells us, and I don't want to speculate here, but what this tells us is that at one time, the serpent wasn't upon his belly. He either had wings and flew, or he had feet and walked. But now he has been cursed to go upon his belly all the days of his life, and to eat dust all the days of his life. Now, science tells us that every time a snake sticks his tongue out, he is retrieving dust particles from the air, from the atmosphere, and taking them back into his body. 
And so although his tongue acts as a sensor of feeling to what is going on around him, the true purpose is for him to partake of the dust of the earth because this is the initial curse that God placed upon the serpent. Now, as we move into verse 15, it's important to note that this is what is considered the first messianic promise in the written word of God. In other words, this is the first time that we see God saying, I'm going to bring someone into the world who is going to undo what has been done here in the garden today. He will be a redeemer purchasing back what originally belonged to me. And this promise you can stand upon, it will take place. And so verse 15 begins by saying, I will put enmity, which is hostility or hatred between thee and the woman. Now we can take this practically that women will fear snakes, but as I stated, this is a messianic promise. So what the Almighty is saying here is I will put hostility between thee and the woman, between thy seed and between her seed. Now there's some teaching going around here And I don't want to go into great detail, but basically they're saying there is a literal seed of Satan that was planted in woman and produced offspring. But that's not what this is talking about here. This is talking about a spiritual seed. Do you remember when Jesus looked at the Pharisees and he said, you're of your father, the devil? Well, he was speaking spiritually because of their rebellion toward God, their choices not to be true to the laws and the things of God showing mercy and compassion, foregoing the exuberant lifestyle that their position offered them. Because of these things, they showed by their actions that they were serving Lucifer, Satan, the evil one, as opposed to serving the true and living God. And so he says, I will cause a hatred between darkness and light, between good and evil between the spiritual offspring of Lucifer and the spiritual offspring of the living God. And it shall bruise thy head. Now in the Hebrew, that word it is actually he. So he shall bruise thy head, which is speaking of Jesus and what he will accomplish on Calvary. He will thrust a devastating blow to the head of Lucifer. But Lucifer will only bruise the heel of Jesus. Now if I were to take a baseball bat and give you the choice of being hit in the heel or the head, which would you take? Well, obviously you would choose the heel because that's not a fatal blow. And so what we're being told here is Jesus is going to strike a fatal blow against darkness, against evil, which would be Satan, the accuser of the brethren. And although Satan is going to attempt a fatal blow against the Lord Jesus, he's only going to strike him in the heel. Now, before we go further in the story... And although it is the serpent that is being cursed here, Satan is standing close by and he's hearing what God is saying. And so immediately he begins to devise a plan to stop this promised one. And as much doesn't take place in the next few verses, when we pick up chapter 4, we are told that Adam knew Eve, his wife, had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain seems to be the lesser of the two. Abel seems to be the righteous one. And so Satan, possibly thinking that Abel may be the promised one, that God is acting very quickly in the promise, enters the heart of Cain and leads Cain to strike down his brother. And it seems that all the way through the history of the people of Israel, every time a righteous one appears on the scene, Satan sets out to destroy him because in his mind, this could be the promised one. Well, in verse 16, as God has pronounced this judgment slash promise, because it is both in verse 15, God says unto the woman, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, there are two things that we see in this passage. One, man was not always meant to rule over woman, and before the fall, Adam didn't rule over Eve. Eve wasn't considered the weaker vessel. She was not in subjection to Adam. She was only in subjection to God. And two, as she gives birth, she will now experience pain. And so what this indicates, and this is a little bit of speculation, is that possibly 
Eve had already given birth in the garden before the fall. And we know later that Cain is going to have to marry his sister because the only offspring upon planet Earth that comes from Adam and Eve. And so it's possible that Eve already had many children before Cain and Abel. But now when she gives children, she's going to experience pain, much pain, in giving birth. Now verse 17, God says unto Adam, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and you've eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat, the ground will be cursed for your sake. Now up until this point, the ground hasn't been cursed. In sorrow you will eat all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee. You will eat the herb of the field, and in the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return unto the ground. For out of it you were taken, dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. So we see that the curse upon man is that he is now going to work by the sweat of his brow. He had already been working, but work was a pleasure. It was an enjoyment. Now it's going to be a curse. It's going to be laborious. And where the earth once produced everything good, now thorns and thistles are going to crop up. And so we can see that thorns and thistles and weeds and things like that are a product of the curse. And so these things won't exist when we get to the new earth. Now weeds are considered to be a pest to man to cause him grief and frustration. So I'll simply pose this as a question because there's real no indication that I can find in scripture. But what about gnats? What about mosquitoes? What about spiders and cockroaches? Will they be in the new earth? Or are these things a product of the fall of man? Well, I don't know about you, but even in a glorified body, even knowing that no creature on earth will ever cause pain or suffering, I cannot see myself in the new earth enjoying the presence of a black widow or tarantula, of a scorpion or of a wasp. And so it would seem to me that these are products of the fall. Well, this part of the story finishes by saying Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So there was no one before her. Every line of man, every race, every nationality has come from Eve. And although the seed of woman may have been corrupted by what took place in the first few verses of Genesis chapter 6, and we'll talk about that more when we get there, Eve is the mother of all the living. In verse 21, we're told that God made coats of skins, of animal skins, and clothed them, which means that God had to kill these animals, which he never intended to do. This is his wonder. This is his creation. But the only way that man can be covered is through the shedding of blood. And as we're told in the book of Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sin. And this is where the animal sacrifice began and carried through all the history of the people of Israel because where life is imparted, life must be sacrificed. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us. He now understands good and evil. And so unless he puts forth his hand and eats of the tree of life and lives forever in this state, the Lord sent man out of the Garden of Eden to work the ground of the earth from which he was taken. And he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims. And he placed there a flaming sword which turned every way to block the way of the tree of life. So what we see in this portion of our story is that there were four levels of accountability. Man, woman, serpent, and Satan. Each acted in rebellion against God. Each was cursed and received severe punishment for their disobedience. And we have a promise that Jesus is going to come and undo this mischievous plot that Satan has set out to alter the things of God, to corrupt the plan of God for man. And the purpose of this story is this, that the better we know our enemy, his tactics, and his strategies, the better prepared we are in the war against us and the war against our souls. If we see how subtly and how craftily he works, 
We'll be on guard in even the smallest of areas, friends. Many of us would not take place in such large acts of disobedience like murder, rape, or genocide. But what about the mere form of deception? Because if you noticed, Satan through the serpent really never lied when he deceived Eve. Go back and look at it. He never told a lie. He simply twisted the truth and used deception to get man to do what he wanted it to do. And the deception is a far greater evil than an outright bold lie. Because an outright bold lie would be on the far left. Absolute truth would be on the far right. But the deception stands right in the middle. Being very hard to detect. Using truth to produce a lie. Does that make sense? Let me give you an example. You're traveling in your car and you're driving seven miles an hour over the speed limit. You're very aware of your speed and a police officer pulls you over. As he begins to speak with you, he informs you that you were going over the speed limit. And you simply reply with a, was I? Now you know that you were speeding. But as you reply with that, was I? You're indicating to the officer that you were not aware of your speed. Now you haven't actually lied because you simply asked a question. But in the way that you asked the question, you were deceiving the officer into thinking something that you know better. That is the same tactics that Lucifer used the serpent to deceive Eve. And it's evil at its core, and we need to be aware of those subtle ways that we even use the intonation of our voices to deceive others and ultimately even deceive ourselves. And that's what we can take from this story, friends. We need to understand how our enemy works so that we can be on guard in each and every moment of our lives, each and every aspect of our lives, and not allow him a foothold. Because as we're told in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, if we do well, will we not be accepted? But if we do not well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is to rule over us, meaning that if we simply leave the door open a crack, Satan has full access to come in and cause much destruction. And so we need to close the door, bolt the door, deadlock the door, nail wooden planks over the door, set barriers in front of the door, everything that we can do to ensure that sin does not find its way into our hearts even in the most subtle of ways. Well, I love you, friends. I'm so grateful that you're again with us this morning, and I pray that you're learning much from the Word of God, and that even though you may have heard these stories many times over, you may be gaining new, fresh insights that allow you to become a more faithful follower of the Lord Jesus in your obedience and your service to Him that will benefit you greatly in your journey. Now, as He wills, and until next time, friends, I do love you, and I'll see you on the next video.